Hi everyone, this is my fourth video on the method of undetermined coefficients. In these three examples, what we're going to look at are instances where the forcing function looks like a component from the homogeneous solution. So I just want to point out how to address that. Since we've already spent a lot of time finding homogeneous solutions and working through the method of undetermined coefficients, these examples are going to be a little bit brief. I'm going to jump straight to the form of the homogeneous solution. I'm not going to write out the characteristic equation and solve for the roots. Then I will show you what the particular solution should be in order to address the fact that your first instinct for the particular solution might duplicate something from the homogeneous solution. Okay, so let's start with this first example. All right, for this first example, if you write down the characteristic equation and find the roots, you arrive at this homogeneous solution. y sub h of x equals c1 e to the negative 2x plus c2 e to the negative 3x. The e to the negative 3x looks like our forcing function. So let me write down what you might initially think should be the particular solution. It could be a generalized version of that right-hand side. So let me write down a constant a times e to the negative 3x. The problem is that if I let c1 equal 0 and c2 be a, then this is actually one version of the homogeneous solution. If I plug this into the left-hand side, I'm going to get 0. You can check that on your own, but because there's a way to choose constant C1 and C2 to be exactly this expression. That means that this is like one version of the homogeneous solution for the right choice of constants. So it solves the homogeneous problem. It cannot solve the forcing. What we need to do is adjust this. And the adjustment is actually just like when we dealt with the situation where the roots of our auxiliary or characteristic equation were real and repeated. We picked up an extra coefficient of x. That's what we're going to do here. So let's try this, ax e to the negative 3x. OK, so that's our guess. Just like when we had a repeated root, we're going to grab an extra copy of x here and see if it works. OK, so let's plug it into the left-hand side and simplify. We have ax e to the negative 3x double prime. plus 5 times the first derivative, plus 6 times the function itself. That is the left-hand side of our equation. It's going to get pretty large because we have to do product rule here. So let me go down. Let's take one copy of, of the derivative here. Using the product rule, that's going to be a e to the negative 3x minus 3a x e to the negative 3x. Still have to differentiate that one more time. And then plus 5 times, actually, we just did this derivative. So 5 times a e to the negative 3x minus 3a x e to the negative 3x. Okay, we're done with that, and then we need to add to this 6ax e to the negative 3x. Okay. Okay, we have to take the derivative one more time here. Differentiate the first component, and we get negative 3a e to the negative 3x. Second component is product rule again. So differentiate x, and we get negative 3a again e to the negative 3x. And then for the differentiating the second term, negative 3 drops down. I think this should look like plus 9ax e to the negative 3x. OK, check me on that. And then distribute, so plus 5a e to the negative 3x minus 15ax e to the negative 3x plus 6. Every term here is either the exponential, 
like here, or x times the exponential. So let's gather like terms. How many just have the exponential? Negative 3a minus 3a is that's negative 6 plus 5 is negative 1, and I think that's it. So negative a e to the negative 3x. And then let's look at the terms that have an x in it. We have 9 plus uh, 6 is 15, minus 15 is 0. So that that happened is actually a good sign. So I've got 9 minus 15 plus 6, that's 0. That's good because we don't have a component in our forcing function that looks like x e to the negative 3x, and we're trying to make this match that. So we wanted these terms that have this extra x in them to cancel out. And if you've done this correctly, you should see that. So now that this is canceled out, we're trying to make this match e to the negative 3x. So that tells us a is what, negative 1? Let me see if in a different color. OK. And now we're done. So the whole solution, let me just write it over here. The general solution to this differential equation, y of x, is this homogeneous solution, which I will not rewrite, minus, so negative 1, minus x e to the negative 3x. OK. So this example showed us how to address the situation when we have a forcing function, which is exponential, but then our homogeneous solution also has exponential components, and one of them is duplicated. In this example, we are looking at y double prime plus 16y equals cosine of 4x. If you work out the homogeneous solution, you should arrive at c1 times cosine of 4x plus c2 times sine of 4x, because the roots to the characteristic equation are pure imaginary. Now, if you look at the forcing function we have in this equation, it's cosine of 4x, and that is exactly what we see here. So if I try to write down maybe a first attempt at a guess for a particular solution without recognizing that we're we're looking at a forcing function which repeats part of the homogeneous solution, you might try something like a cosine of 4x plus b sine of 4x. Okay, so you could try that. However, I'm calling the coefficients here a and b instead of c1 and c2, but if you were made a little renaming for the coefficients here, it's an exact duplicate of the homogeneous solution which means if I take this attempt at a particular solution and I plug it into the left-hand side, after simplification, we will get zero because it's a homogeneous solution. There's no way we are going to be able to determine coefficients a and b that would cause us to arrive at cosine of 4x. Okay, so since we are duplicating part of the homogeneous solution here with our forcing function, what you could next do is drop an x with each of these terms, and that's fine. So if you'd like to proceed in this way, go ahead. You don't have to do what I'm going to do for the rest of this example. So at this point, I said, here's your modification of the particular solution. You can proceed in this way. So since we now know what you would do, you just drop an x in front. Let me introduce in another technique to solving this kind of equation when your right-hand side is a trig function like cosine of 4x. And that is to use what's called complexification. So complexification. It's a name that sounds like we're going to make things more complex, but my, in my opinion, we actually make things easier. What I'm going to do is recognize that cosine of 4x is the real part of the complex exponential e to the 4ix. So I can even write that this forcing function on the right-hand side is the real part of e to the 4ix. So since we have a piece of e to the 4ix, our particular solution could be like a generalized version of that complex exponential. So I'll write down the complex exponential, a e to the 4ix. This is the particular solution I would use if we weren't having any repeating behavior, but since we are, I'm actually also going to drop an x here. Okay, so this was like the generalized complex exponential, but because of the repeating action, 
we, we pick up a coefficient of x, just like we did with the first example. Okay, now we're just going to proceed in the usual way. I'm going to work with this complex exponential. There are going to be real parts, imaginary parts. At the end, I will explain how to extract the information we need in order to match it up with cosine of 4x. Okay, so let's plug this into the left-hand side. ax e to the 4ix prime prime plus 16ax e to the 4ix. One reason why I like complexification is I like differentiating exponential functions. We have a product rule here, which is a little bit unfortunate, but we would have that too if we'd stayed with sine and cosine. So I still think differentiating the exponential function is preferable. Let's do one round of the differentiation at a time. So we, we will say a e to the four i x plus, here when I differentiate the second piece, the four i will come down. So we'll pick up an imaginary piece that looks like 4i ax e to the 4ix. I have to differentiate that one more time. Then plus 16ax e to the 4ix. Okay, we need to take this derivative one more time. This piece is nice. The 4i comes down. 4i a e to the 4ix. Then here, when I differentiate with respect to x in this term, we will have 4i a e to the 4ix. So we will actually double this quantity. In the interest of saving space, let me just go ahead and combine those like terms. We will have a total of 8i a e to the 4ix. And then 4i will come down again when I look at the second term in my product rule. So we will have 16i squared a x e to the 4 i x. And then we still have our 16 a x e to the 4 i. You should see something really desirable. And that is 16 i squared is negative 16 because i squared is negative 1. In the last example, I said you, you wanted that term that had the extra coefficient of x to cancel out. And here we see the exact same thing happening. So we have negative 16 ax e to the 4ix plus 16 ax e to the 4ix. So all this goes away, leaving us with just 8i a e to the 4ix. With my generalization, trying to match that up with e to the 4ix. So I'm imagining here, I've kind of made the problem larger by replacing cosine 4x with this complex exponential on the right-hand side and then generalizing that. So if we want, I'm going to do that over here. 8i a e to the 4ix to match up, oh, sorry, with just e to the 4ix, different computation, then that means 8i a equals 1. So a equals 1 divided by 8i. Often, we like to not have the imaginary component in the denominator. So if you multiply this by i over i, it turns into 8i squared. So that's negative 8 in the denominator, just i in the numerator. So I will write negative i over 8. OK, I've solved for this coefficient a here. but this was for a slightly different problem where I basically took my starting forcing function and I replaced it in my mind with the complex exponential e to the 4ix. We need now to go back to that starting problem. So what I need to do is, is take this coefficient, put it into the particular solution, and back out of that the uh, component that should solve for the cosine of 4x. Let me give you a minute to kind of digest this before we move on to solving the differential equation that we actually started with. All right, I got rid of the algebra that brought us to a value for this coefficient a. Let's now substitute that into this expression. So I will write negative i over 8x. And then where I have the complex exponential, let me use Euler's formula and write that as cosine of 4x plus i sine of 4x.
Now what I'm going to do is distribute. So the first expression is going to be negative i x over 8 times cosine of 4 x. And then the second expression is negative i squared over 8 uh, times x times sine of 4x. OK, here's the thing. We have negative i squared here. That's just 1. So this whole term is real. This term is imaginary. Let me actually reverse the order here, because typically we write real part plus i times imaginary component. So this is overall x over 8 sine of 4x, and then plus i times negative x over 8 cosine of 4x. OK, let me give you a minute to digest that. Okay, one of the major themes with the method of undetermined coefficients is that we match like terms. So this is the real part of the particular solution that I wrote down for the complex exponential forcing. So this real part goes with the real part of the complex forcing. So this is the particular solution for cosine of 4x. That's the problem we have. So if we wanted to be done with our problem, we could say, we're done. We have the homogeneous solution and the particular solution. But there's a bonus here. And that is that the imaginary part of this complex particular solution solves for the part of the uh, complex exponential forcing, which is imaginary. So this would be the particular solution If the forcing function was sine of 4x, all right, so now we're done with this example. Using the process of complexification, where I took my real part of the complex exponential and I essentially went up to the complex exponential, solved all that out, we found the particular solution for the forcing function that we have, cosine of 4x. But we also found the particular solution for sine of 4x. It's this negative, eight over, negative x over 8 cosine of 4x, excuse me. Let me leave you with a question, and I'll put up the answer in a few seconds. What would the particular solution be if our forcing function on the right-hand side was cosine of 4x plus sine of 4x? All right, let's take a look at this example. I did a lot of the work already with the homogeneous solution, but if you take a moment to work out the characteristic equation, what you will find is that there's only one root, r equals negative one, and it's repeated. That means that our homogeneous solution takes this form where one of our fundamental solutions picks up this coefficient of x. Okay, look at the forcing function and write down for a moment what you think it should look like. All right, if the roots were not negative one, we would guess a e to the negative x. But we recognize that e to the negative x is already here. So then you think, all right, well then let's put an x in front of it and guess a x e to the negative x. But that is already here. So what we're going to do is just drop another x in front. Let's try a x squared e to the negative x. So we picked up an x twice because we repeated a repeated root. OK, um, because of the product rule here, it's a lot of differentiation to plug this into the left-hand side. I went ahead and did this ahead of time. So if you do ax squared e to the negative x prime prime plus twice the first derivative plus the function itself, ax squared e to the negative x, expand all this out, simplify, collect like terms, and you should get, let's see, what did I write down? 2a e to the negative x.
again, I did all that work before starting this video uh, because you know this would just be expand, collect like terms. Notice that the only term left just has e to the negative x in it. There's no copy of x e to the negative x or x squared e to the negative x. Again, that's when you think, yes, I've done it correctly. We want this to be just plain old e to the negative x, so 2a is 1. So a is 1 half. All right, let me write out the full solution to this differential equation. Our solution is the sum of the homogeneous component c1e to the negative x plus c2xe to the negative x, now plus 1 half x squared e to the negative x. Okay, so I hope this lesson gave you a good idea of how to proceed when you recognize that your forcing function is repeating one of the fundamental components of the homogeneous solution.